This is the Yonkazine Brief with Peter Hofflin and Sonia Portillo. This episode of the Oncogen Brief comes from Chicago, where we report from the annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, which was held May 31st to June 4th, 2019. In this episode, I talk with Dr. Hartmut Juhl, the Chief Executive Officer of Indivimed, a physician-led integrated global oncology company. The company offers specialized products and services designed to support the discovery of biomarkers, drug development, clinical trials, and individualized treatment for patients with cancer. In this edition, I also talk with Jenny Hu, Vice President, Clinical Development of Rakuten Medical. The company is developing precision-targeted medicines through development of a novel proprietary photoimmunotherapy platform. Let's listen. We are um, at the uh, annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Uh, here with me is Hartmut Juhl. I have to pronounce the name right. Absolutely. You are a physician, a doctor um, in Germany. At the same time, you're also the CEO of a company called Indivumet. Yes. And you are working in an area that is um, relatively popular in the media in terms of uh, communication, but a little bit less understood in the way we talk about it or what it actually means. It's individualized or personalized medicine, specifically focused in oncology. Now, before we going to talk about that, tell me a little bit more about your own background, because I thought it was very interesting in, in, in the little chat that we had before the program about um, how you got here into um, this area of personalized medicine and the company that you run right now. So... I found it in Divium. Uh, Actually, my background is surgical oncology. I did that in my first 12 years of my career. So I worked in academic surgery. That means I also was very interested in research all the time during my surgical career. At one point, I decided to go in full-time research and started uh, to work at Georgetown University. I had my own lab there about translational research. And I was surprised at the time when individualized medicine just came up in the horizon and that I was very surprised about the fact that in science, in the research lab, people do care about everything and standardization, but they never had thought about or they don't think about that a tissue has a history which goes in, this, in the research project. And, and the tissue you talk about, the and cancer? I or... talk about tumor, tumor cancer tissue, which is the basis for all discovery and all research in oncology. So the starting point for Divimed was to understand that if you want to understand the complexity of cancer, and that's the goal of our company, if you want to understand this complexity, you have to take care about the quality of the specimen and you have to make sure that what you measure is real and is really happening in the patient. Um, If you think about that a patient or a human being is brain death after eight minutes without blood flow. And you think about that a tissue specimen usually is in a surgical suite for hours or at least for half an hour or an hour before it's fixed. You understand how variable the data become if you don't care about this initial process of tissue sampling. And that's where Indivimid started to individualize medicine. So that means that you have a first certain way of preparing a, a sample? Yes, we have uh, implemented more than 130 SOPs, meanwhile, about how to collect tissue regardless from what tumor entity in always the same way. And we have uh, managed to apply these standards in the hospital network all around the globe. So with many clinics in the U.S., but also in Europe and in Asia. Now, tell me, when, when you have that, uh, that tissue sample right, for a, a patient, then... What is your goal with that? What what are you trying to do with that tissue sample? Yeah, so we collect these samples, as I said, in a standardized way all over the place um, in in the world, all the different places. And what the goal is with these samples to understand the deaths of cancer from every individual patient. There are many cancer databases around which have focused on genetics and do genetic sequencing. But we know, meanwhile, like a butterfly is different in the phenotype compared to a caterpillar and they have the identical genes that the phenotype is much more important. But the phenotype depends on what has happened with a tissue specimen before it was frozen for research purposes. So 
the goal is that we understand the complexity of this, these tumors by going now onto frozen material and compare tumor tissue and normal tissue from thousands of patients where the tissue is identically collected, so it's standardized, and that means we get comparable data over patient cohorts, over countries, over ethnicities, so that we understand the variability of tumors um, on a global scale. Now, you work with, with uh, different companies. You work in the clinic, uh, but you also work uh, with pharma companies um, to share that information, to, to help them in the development of new therapeutic agents, new drugs to, for, to fight cancer. Tell me a little bit about the importance for, uh, for pharma company to understand what you're doing. For pharma companies, uh, this, these databases have the big advantage that they understand much deeper and much better the biology of cancer to begin with. So it's about target discovery, target validation. But with our clinical network where we obtain these kind of data from patients which are currently under treatment when we do these analyses, we are also able to identify patients who qualify best for a certain drug trial. This helps the patient, but it helps also the pharma company to get the drug much faster approved. So that means that instead of having a call out, there is a clinical trial, you can register for this trial. If you're now going to ask patients to participate, you know that they have a specific cancer, a specific uh, disease in which they potentially can benefit from a particular drug. Correct. So by identifying, by understanding the complex profile, we are able to identify certain targets which are currently under investigation with new drugs. Now, if you go one step further, I mean, this is very going towards personalized medicine, right? You, you look at a particular individual patient and why they can benefit or why they may have a, a genetic alteration and so that might help um, focusing on, on their treatment. But if you look at, at the, the whole field, um, it's, it's it, it, everything that you do in terms of personalized man, uh, medicine, if you look at the complexity involved, therapeutic When you speak about personalized medicine, people don't always understand what that means. There are different terms, different uh, words being used. People use personalized medicine. They use targeted approach to medicine or targeted therapies. They use, you use um, individualized medicine. Shine a little bit light on, on those different terms and, and how important it is to get the right understanding of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, and not only you, but in, in general, what uh, people should understand and take away from this. Yeah. I mean, the major challenge in this field is to balance science with uh, the possibility to apply something in the clinical routine world. That's, that's where the challenge is. What we try, we really come from the science end and not what is easy to apply. And that means... <laughs> that, that is a challenge, I guess. That is a challenge, yeah. So it starts already with having frozen material instead of routine pathology tissue, which is formal and fixed. But this does not allow you to understand the protein level or the phosphoprotein level, the activity of pathways. It's not possible to, to analyze from these tissues. So our first step is to, to develop mechanisms where you are able, or structures where you are able to collect frozen material in a large scale. So we are going to work with more than 100 clinics in the near future where we obtain the same tissues, uh, frozen material from these patients all over the globe. That is the most ch the major challenge. So uh, developing new approaches in a routine world. The second is if, if this results, and I'm absolutely confident it does, in, um, in better data which qualify to better outcome of therapies, the proof is made that this it's worth to, to take this effort. But the challenge is to do that at a time when you are no, don't receive funding for that, from reimbursement from clinical systems, which are very in slow motion, and to apply these uh, new structures um, in a much better way on a global scale in, in various clinics. And that's what we, have, what we have solved to some extent. Right. Well, that is a major step, I guess. It's, it's something that really not, not a lot of people are thinking about, I assume. Let's take a quick break and then we're back with more. Each day, researchers make new discoveries that bring us closer to the moment when all cancer patients can become survivors. Some days they take small steps. Others, huge discoveries lead to giant leaps forward. 
This progress, both small steps and giant leaps, happens with the help of clinical trials. Clinical trials are a fundamental path to progress and the brightest torch researchers have to light their way towards better treatments. And if you've been diagnosed with cancer, they may be your brightest ray of hope. Clinical trials introduce new hope in addition to the current standard of care by allowing researchers to provide participants access to cutting edge and potentially life-saving treatments. So if you're interested in exploring new treatment options while helping to light the path for other patients, clinical trials may be the best choice for you. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more about clinical trials. Together, we can stand up for all of us. You listen when your body says, I'm tired or I'm hungry. Are you listening? Would you listen if your body said, I have pain and pressure in my abdomen. I feel bloated for no good reason. Or, I get too full too fast. I'm spotting, but I've already gone through menopause. Or, I have to go to the bathroom more often and more urgently than usual. These can be signs of a gynecologic cancer, like cervical, ovarian, uterine, vaginal, and vulvar cancers. Symptoms aren't the same for everyone. If your body says something may be wrong, please listen, learn the symptoms, and get the inside knowledge about gynecologic cancers. Call 1-800-CDC-INFO. A message from the Inside Knowledge Campaign and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. And welcome back. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Ongo Scene Brief. During this ASCO, um, you have some presentations. You were looking at... uh, Tell me a little bit about what you tell the people around here, what's going on with what what you're doing. What's the purpose of your... At ASCO, your participation here? In particular at ASCO, when I look around, I see many advertisements, and it's all about data. Yes. Data is a big thing, and we also about data now. But uh, the, the main message I have is look on the quality of the data and the depth of the information, and that's a big difference we have. So there are many genetic databases around who say we have genomics. Genomics means in one case we have looked at 30 genes. In other cases, maybe at 500 genes. Some do whole exome sequencing. Nobody looks for whole genome sequencing, what we do, which means you measure everything. Then you have to have databases where you look into the protein levels. There are actually none around. We do that too. And what I'm trying to say is not we are the best, which may be the truth. <laughs> but what I try to say is If you have a complex disease like cancer, where you really want to understand the complexity and you want to simplify your drug development process, you have to understand the complexity. You have to look for a a complex solution to address a complex problem. And that's what, that's what we, what we try to do. And what, what I personally, as a personal note, what I'm really tired of is, um, that everything is about very fast success short-term thinking and also in money and in funding. But you have, you have to address the problem with a much longer breath. And that's what we try to do because that's the only way how you can address this challenge. You mentioned, of course, of the, the differences. I mean, you, you do this kind of global level and of the fact that um, a lot of companies are, or a lot of organizations are looking at only a very myopic view of, of, of what's going on in, in biology or whether it's cancer biology or potential for treatment. I can imagine that if you are, um, when, you, when you try to collect information and you are looking on a worldwide scale, if you work in Germany or you work in, in other European countries versus the United States or maybe some Asian countries, that what you do is different. And not because it is uh, the technology what you try to kind of, um, the, the problem that you try to solve, but some of the regulatory aspects are different. How does that impact um, where the way you look at patients, but also the way you look at samples, for example, and the way you look at getting that information out? Yeah, I think overall we do not see, actually we do not see a, a big difference. If you are in Singapore, in India, in Germany or in the US, there are always patients who suffer from cancer and they all suffer from a similar disease. 
and they all look for the best treatment, the patients, the, the clinics, the hospitals. So from the openness to address this problem in a most standardized way, in a very high quality oriented way, the, the request is the same. And that makes it easier to come over the regulatory issues. Of course, we have if differences with respect to patients' privacy rules. Right. Um, we, follow, we follow the most stringent private, private rules we, we can have, like it's in Europe at this time, I think. Mm -hmm. So we apply these standards all over the globe. So that surrounds the problem of privacy rules in different countries. We follow the strictest rules. If it comes to, there are some differences in countries with respect to handling tissue. In Asia, it's not very popular to get tissue, or it's not possible actually to get tissue out of the country. But we can analyze this in the country and we can get the data out of the country for better understanding. So there are ways to come around these regulatory issues. And we are pretty good in that, meanwhile, having learned this now to do in Asia, Europe, and in, and in the U.S. and different countries. Right. Now, one of the things, and, and, and we were talking a little bit about uh, that before, in the communication in your press releases, but also in information on your website, in, in when you talk to people, the words revolutionary, uh, game-changing, um, uh, it's being mentioned. Um, this is changing the way we look at medicine. Tell me a little bit about that. Because, of, of course, I mean, if you look at, uh, I mean, I remember a couple of years ago, 5, 10, 15 years ago, when people started looking at different forms of treatment of cancer, um, that's game-changing, that's just different. We, we look at uh, presentations at ASCO, well, this is really practice-changing in the way we look at, at, at how we treat patients. How is what you do actually changing things? Yeah. I mean, this, these buzzwords are used from everybody. And it's exactly. very difficult to find out what is real and what is not real and just a buzz, use the buzzword. I think um, the major difference, if you look just on the facts, if you look on what kind of analyzers have been done, what kind of data can be provided, that is the convincing part. And that is probably, that's where I think we, are, we can claim such disruptive developments. But at the end, it is about the outcome. And uh, if, if we have a data set now created within a few weeks, actually, uh, from the basis of our thousands of frozen samples, which is far above any um, output of information like TCGA, a huge project from the NIH, where we can go be far beyond that information now, that look, it's looking at the facts which makes the difference. And, of course, the data and the way to analyze that data. Of course, yeah. And that's, of course, also needed. You need, I mean, all what we do now, we couldn't have done it. Nobody could have done it five years ago. Because, and that's because the, the computer Because power? the technology was not there to have a sensitive technology to analyze tissues in the stats in a payable manner so that you can effort it. I mean, whole genome project was one billion for one patient. Now it's thousand dollars for one patient. Yeah. And um, so... It became affordable, but then came the computer technology and the power of, of uh, artificial intelligence, which we add to our data now, which we couldn't have done five years ago because it was not available. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Here at uh, ASCO uh, 2019, um, we are covering some of the exciting news and developments um, in the area of oncology. This year, there's a lot of new information, a lot of poster presentation, a lot of uh, oral presentations talking about the latest developments in oncology and, and the treatment options that are there. Here with me is Janie Hu. Um, she is the Vice President Clinical Development at Rakuten Medical. I hope I do pronounce that name the right way. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. You um, did it perfectly. Thank you. It's like that. Now, now where is my award, right? The TV <laughs> commercial. But talking about the, the company, the Rakuten and, and the TV commercial and the, the emphasis that the company has on getting their name out right now and pronounced the right way. Uh, Rakuten Medical is a division or a, a co-unit co with or subdivision of the company or working with the company. How, how is that relation? How does that relation exist? Actually, it's a sister company. Oh, this sister is company. How, yeah, this is how we like to refer to Rakuten uh, Medical. Um, we have the same CEO, Mickey Mikitani, who is our um, CEO of Rakuten Medical as well as Rakuten Inc. Right. And Rakuten actually started, uh, what well, Rakuten Medical actually started originally as Experience Therapeutic. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, uh, it started in 2010 with Miguel Guzman, who is our founder. And he actually licensed in a technology, the photoimmunotherapy, from the NIH. 
So he saw the promise of this technology. Um, Mickey, our current CEO, actually also similarly um, saw that as well and uh, decided to invest in it. And uh, over the um, the next essentially approximately, uh, I would say, nine years, I think, uh, you know, uh, he made additional investments. And uh, and today we're a clinically, uh, clinical stage, mm-hmm. pri- privately funded biopharmaceutical fun- uh, company. Right. And, and you said Asperian? That was the previous company or so, the company that actually is the founding company of what Frackerton Medical is right now? Right. So the original company was Asperian. So it's since changed um, to Rakuten Asperian and then finally Rakuten Medical um, in uh, late 2018. Okay. Now, you have a background in oncology? Yes, I'm a medical oncologist by training. And uh, you have a ex- corporate history as well? Absolutely. Um, actually, I've worked at AstraZeneca, where I've actually helped uh, design the, uh, the development of Cabrelsa, which is currently uh, indicated for treatment of medullary thi- thyroid cancer. I also helped develop uh, Vemurafenib, also mm-hmm. known as Zelbaraf, at uh, Genentech. And most recently, I helped develop uh, Vismodegib, which is um, Aravage for the treatment of basal cell carcinoma. Right. So a very long history and very exciting history to see some of the, the novel therapies come to fruition. Well, I think I've just been um, in the right place at the right time, and I'm, uh, you know, incredible, incredibly privileged to have been on all of these teams and uh, supported, helped, and uh, you know, made these therapies a success. And that's part of the reason why I would like to join Rakuten Medical. Um, I think this uh, photoimmune therapy is, uh, I think, it's really an amazing um, therapeutic option that I really would like to prove the efficacy uh, as well as the safety. Let's take a quick break, and then we're back with our interviews coming to you from the annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, held earlier this year in Chicago. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Oncosin Brief. Some of the best sounds you'll ever hear are generic, safe, effective, even money-saving, just like FDA-approved generic drugs. Even if they don't come in the exact same color or shape as their brand name equivalents, they have the same key ingredients and go through a rigorous review process. Talk to your doctor or pharmacist today and visit fda.gov slash generic drugs. Generics are safe, effective, and can save you money. You'll like the sound of that. Most of us like to be out in the sun. That's why sunscreen and other safety measures are key to protecting your skin from aging and cancer. The FDA recommends using a sunscreen with a sun protection factor, or SPF, of 15 or higher. Also, look for broad spectrum on the label. That means both harmful ultraviolet A and B rays are blocked. UVA rays age the skin, UVB rays burn, and both cause cancer. But the perfect sunscreen doesn't count if you use it wrong. Don't need sunscreen on a cloudy day? Wrong. 80% of UV rays still get through the haze. Only use sunscreen at the beach? Nope. Anytime you're outside, UV rays attack the skin, so you need protection. And you have to reapply sunscreen every two hours. Remember, SPF plus broad spectrum equal healthy fun in the sun. Visit www.fda.gov slash sunscreen for more information. A message from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. And welcome back. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Oncosin Brief. Now, tell me a little bit about, because, I mean, people here and, and all our, also our audience, uh, they, they will hear about uh, chemotherapy. They will hear about uh, targeted therapy, about all kinds of forms of therapies. Uh, when you talk about chemotherapy, people have a kind of an, an idea what that might be. Uh, when you talk about targeted therapy, people can consider what that is. Uh, phototherapy, photoimmune therapy may be something they may not have heard about that often. Can you explain simply what, what, what that kind of therapy that is, what it means, and, and, and how it works? 
Well, I think you're absolutely right. This is a new type of um, therapeutic platform. And we think about it in a platform basis because what we have done so far with our lead molecule, ASP1929, is to take an EGFR um, receptor antibody and to um, couple it or conjugate it to Mm -hmm. a, a dye. And so this uh, EGFR antibody actually targets the tumor, and then the activation of the dye, actually the dye is actually a very non-toxic, inert Mm -hmm. compound by itself, but when a light, uh, an intense red light shines on it, it actually activates it, and actually what happens then is that there is cell cell membrane disruption, which then leads to cell death and tumor necrosis. So this is really a, a very unique uh, approach to essentially uh, treatment of tumors. And we hope to actually um, make that, uh, you know, that promise real um, to patients. And so you said an antibody? Correct. Um, it's conjugated. So it is, it is akin or similar to an antibody drug conjugate, except what you put as a payload is non-toxic. If you look at uh, some of the, the, the antibody drug conjugates, they have a very high toxic payload. In your case, um, it's an antibody with a non-toxic entity, which is activated from, what you said, a, an outside source? Yes, absolutely, Peter. You're, you're absolutely right. So it is a non-toxic um, payload that's conjugated or attached to an antibody. And the antibody is actually not acting as a pharmacologic agent, although we all know that that can be. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but at the doses that we're given and the frequency that we're given is really non-pharmacologic. What it's intended to do is to deliver the payload to the right location so that we can come back on day two um, to shine a light on the tumor. And shining a light means basically then kill the tumor. Well, yes. Well, that then leads to the activation of the dye and then uh, it's an excitation of the dye, which then leads to the tumor death, okay. tumor kill. So one of the things, before we're going to talk a little bit about the poster presentations that you have here at ASCO, when, when, when you look at this, it's, it's a, a very targeted therapy. Yes. Um, but even with targeted therapies, um, and even though there may be some virtually non-toxic kind of elements in there, there are side effects. If people are uh, in clinical trials or other trials are being, being, being a candidate for this drug, are there certain side effects that they have to worry about? Well, you know, I think... Uh, all drugs have side effects. I think the the question is what type of side effect, how, what what the severity of the side effects have, that have been experienced by the patients. And so with our drug, we actually see very few um, side effects that are specific, specifically related to our therapy. And so items like rash or erythema that is associated um, can be associated with our drug. And certainly um, potential for swelling and local, uh, essentially, application of the the light that may actually lead to some additional um, skin irritations. And the way that the light is delivered can actually lead to some swelling. But, you know, all in all, very um, well tolerated from our perspective. Okay. Now, you have at this meeting, at this uh, ASCO 2019, you have a number of uh, posters there. I think there are two posters being you, you present, two different kind of stages of clinical trials. One is in, I think, stage one, and, and the other is in a later stage. Tell me a little bit about those two drugs. What's the difference? And, and, and I mean, the, my understanding is they're both in a recurrent head and neck cancer. Yeah, so let me just clarify. So we, we presented our phase 2A data. Um, which is with RM1929. So that is, um, it, it's a very, the drug RM1929 is also an EGFR agent. And, uh, and so in terms of the, the targeting um, antibody. Mm-hmm. And so ASB1929 is just a different type of um, EGFR antibody, but essentially very, very similar. And so we don't think that there's really any bio, um, biological or pharmacological effect, uh, differences between the two molecules. But ultimately, the target might be different. And because of the molecule, the, the monoclonal antibody, it's slightly different? No, actually, they're not. They're, they're targeting both the EGFR agent. Okay. I mean, EGFR receptor. Right. Now, talk, talk with me about some of the results that you had within your poster presentations. Yeah, sure. So, in terms of the, the results that we observed in the Phase 2A, um, we actually enrolled 30 patients in the study. These were patients with um, relapsed refractory, recurrent head neck ca- cancer. 
um, squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, these patients were primarily older, mostly male, and actually had a number of different locations, including the oral pharynx, the hypopharynx, the oral cavity. And so these patients really um, uh, have had at least two prior lines of therapy. So really later stage of um, their disease, essentially in the uh, in the M- M0, M1 setting. Uh, two patients have uh, lung metastases and then um, uh, several others had um, skin metastases. So you, you talk about patients that are gravely ill? Yes. Now, you talk about clinical trial data if a small population. Mm-hmm. That is to prove that the drug is safe? Well, um, we wanted to evaluate both the safety but also efficacy. So at the phase 2A um, setting, we're, lo- we're starting to really look at the efficacy. And what we sh- um, saw in our study um, is that 43% of the patient actually achieved um, overall response. 13 out of the, um, the 30 actually had um, a, a, a CR. Okay, so it means a, a complete response. And that means in, in layman terms, they, they, they responded well to the treatment. Yeah, no, they, they, they responded incredibly well. And, uh, and I wanted to clarify, I apologize. It's actually four out of the 13 had a complete response. Now, when you look at the development of this drug, I mean, now it's in, in clinical stage 2A. Um, uh, the next step is a phase 3 trial? Correct. So the other poster was a presentation of our phase 3 study, which currently has um, is uh, enrolling patients in the U.S. and Japan. So they're open for enrollment. We're anticipating to enroll um, 275 patients from U.S., Europe, and Asia Pacific region. And the, the trial is actually looking at a very similar population, but only with local regional disease. And it's randomized two to one between um, the experimental arm, which is the photoimmunotherapy with ASP1929 uh, versus standard of care. So this is based on um, physician choice. Right. Now, if you're in oncology somewhere in the country... Whether it's in Europe or Asia, um, we uh, uh, on both sides of the of, of of the world. What do you want an oncologist to know about this potential treatment, and if they may have a candidate uh, for inclusion in a clinical trial? How do they um, enroll a patient? Well, um, we we certainly. Um you know, I think in terms of this therapy, I think um, this is a therapy that um, that we would like for people to be aware of as an option for these patients. This therapy, uh, patients uh, should be able to enroll um, after, even after PD-1 treatment. So there's been lots of excitement at ASCO this mm-hmm. year um, with patients uh, with PD-1 demonstrating um, benefit in the first line setting. So we can go after those patients um, certainly as a additional uh, therapeutic option. We would like to let them know that this is really a therapy that has potential for great efficacy, um, particularly in the local regional setting, but also is actually fairly tolerable and manageable for the patients uh, in terms of the safety profile. And I think we need to do more um, treatment uh, in this patient population to really find out um, how we can Uh, develop novel therapies for these patients uh, because clearly um, survival is still less than one year despite all of these, you know, improvements in therapeutic options. Um, But we need to actually um, find more treatment options for these um, these patients. Let's take a break and then we're back with more. Over the years, you've brought them into your home. You were prescribed opioids after the C-section, when dad injured his back, when your basketball star tore his ACL. Opioids helped with the pain, and you held on to them, just in case. But did you know holding on to unused opioids puts your family at risk? Opioids are powerful, pain-reducing prescription medicines. But most people who are prescribed opioids don't finish their prescriptions. So millions of unused opioids are sitting in homes across the country, And tragically, more than 100 Americans die every day from overdoses involving opioids. What can you do to protect your family? Remove the risk of unused opioids from your home. Pills, patches, or syrups in drawers, purses, and cabinets. Anywhere they might be hiding. To find out how to dispose of them properly, visit www.fda.gov slash drug disposal. You listen when your body says... 
I'm tired, or I'm hungry. Are you listening? Would you listen if your body said, I have pain and pressure in my abdomen, I feel bloated for no good reason, or I get too full too fast? I'm spotting, but I've already gone through menopause. Or I have to go to the bathroom more often and more urgently than usual. These can be signs of a gynecologic cancer, like cervical, ovarian, uterine, vaginal, and vulvar cancers. Symptoms aren't the same for everyone. If your body says something may be wrong, please listen, learn the symptoms, and get the inside knowledge about gynecologic cancers. Call 1-800-CDC-INFO. A message from the Inside Knowledge Campaign and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. If you're just joining us, this week the Angazine Brief comes from Chicago, where we spent a long weekend during the annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology to talk and to listen to the experts and to digest the latest information in the development of new anti-cancer drugs. So when, when, after phase three, um, you have registration. Um, right. Uh, so when you look at where you're right now mm-hmm. um, and the potential, not only in the clinical trials, but the potential to actually be um, available to any patient that is actually out there. How long th- would that take from now till it's available to anyone? Well, I think that, that that's a crystal ball question that it's really hard to answer, Peter. But, you know, suffice to say, we would like to have this available as soon as possible. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the sooner the better, uh, in my, my opinion. Um, if there are people that are interested in participating, um, they can certainly contact me directly. Um, you can go to clinicaltrial.gov right. to find out who to contact. Um, we have sites uh, in the U.S., um, both East Coast and West Coast. We have um, sites in, in Europe that we're hoping to start up very soon. Um, sites in Japan, Taiwan, Korea, South Korea are all open. Okay, well, that's a very generous uh, um, uh, option. Doesn't doesn't happen that often, but it is really exciting that people who may need um, or are looking, uh, or sometimes desperately looking for a way to uh, for treatment options, that they have that option. That is very generous. Um, well, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Photoimmunotherapy is a type of molecular targeted cancer therapy which allows the selective destruction of cancer cells without any damage to normal tissue. It is a light-based cancer therapy. In our interview with Jenny Hu, Vice President Clinical Development of Rakuten Medical, we spoke about clinical trials that are underway for this new antibody-based anti-cancer platform, which has shown promise in selectively destroying tumors and activating anti-cancer immune responses. In our interview with Dr. Hartmut Jull, we spoke about the unique services offered by his company, which provides the foundation for the analysis of complex clinical and molecular signatures from cancer patients, enabling researchers and physicians to better diagnose and to tailor cancer treatment to individual patients. We are at the end of this special edition of the Onkers in Brief, recorded during the annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. For more information about clinical trials and drug development and how new anti-cancer agents are benefiting patients, visit the website of the American Society of Clinical Oncology at www.asco.org. Here you can find more doctor-approved information. For us here at the Yonkers in Brief, we want to thank you, our listeners, supporters, and advertisers for your ongoing support. Thanks to your support, our program now has a wider reach with distribution via iHeartRadio, in addition to PRX, Public Radio Exchange, and in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe via UK Health Radio. And your support made it possible that our program is now also distributed in Canada and Australia. You can also download our program via iTunes. And you can listen to the Onkers in Brief via Spotify and other streaming media. In Arizona, you can listen to the Onkers in Brief via Independent Talk 1100 KFNX, one of the top 10 radio stations in Arizona, reaching almost 5 million people throughout the state. 
For more information about that, check our online journal Oncozine at www.oncozine.com. If you want to support our program, please visit our website and look for the Oncozine Brief. Here you can find more information about the way you can help us. And your support for this program is important. It allows us to bring you interviews with experts involved in the development of novel diagnostics and new treatments. If you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER to 66866, and we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. Thank you all, and thank you for listening, and join us again for our next episode. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngers in Brief. The Oncozine Brief was produced for Sun Valley Communication by Peter Hofflin, Sonia Portillo, Evan Wint, David Kaler, and Sean Mayer, and distributed by InPress Media Group. Support for the Oncozine Brief comes from listeners of this station and our commercial underwriters and advertisers. For more information about underwriting and sponsoring options, contact Sean Mayer in California at 949 923 1660 or visit our website at oncozine.com forward slash underwriting. The Oncozine Brief contains health and medicine related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice. Your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health If you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it.